Really enjoy hearing Brother Greg sing. If you're so appreciative as well, would you stand all over our church house this morning? And I'm going to give you just one moment. Would you look over at your neighbor and say, you look marvelous. You look marvelous. You do.
You look marvelous. You look marvelous. Thank you. Marvelous. You talking to me? No, it's a, you talking to me? It can't be. Oh, it is so fun to be here. It is so good to have everyone here at Oklahoma this morning. What a joy it is. And um, I'm going to just say, wow, thank you all for being here. We've already had a wonderful time of Sunday school. Uh, we, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've already had a wonderful time of Sunday school and um, a time of singing and just uh, welcoming, and we do. We just genuinely love you. So I'm going to invite you, if you would, let's go before our Lord in a word of prayer. Our most kind, wonderful, loving Lord, thank you. Thank you for this moment. Lord, as I look out and I see family. I see familiar faces, I see regular faces, new faces, Lord, I see your children. And Lord, we are excited about what's going to happen in this service today. I know that all the distractions are trying to pull many away. So devil, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this church service. May our hearts and our minds be in unison as we focus in on you as we do love you because you are marvelous. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated this morning. I, I want to share with you, as you get your Bibles prepared, we are in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at primarily verses 33 through 37. Matthew 5, 33 through 37. And what I'd like to share with you is we are teaching the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we've been going over this. This is week number eight as we are in a series this morning. And as Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he, he began with what we called the Beatitudes. And he was talking about the blessings. If you do this, you will receive a blessing. And if you continue with this, there's blessings and rewards for being obedient to the Father. Oh, how good that is. But then he goes on <coughs> to give basic instructions for what it means to follow the Father's will. And it starts out like saying, wow, I, I can't wait to get on board with this. But then throughout his sermon, it gets more difficult and more challenging because everybody has no problem following when the land is level. No one has a hard time going when it's downhill but there's times when it gets rocky and there's times when it's uphill. And those are hard times to follow. It's hard to follow when it gets dark. It's hard to follow when the temperature's not just quite the way you like it. But Jesus still gives the same command to all, follow me. So that today we are getting to the place and point where he's been addressing those at the Sermon on the Mount. As he addresses those who try to legislate his, uh, the law and his commandments that he stated. And while addressing those legislators, he also addresses those liberals who try to reduce the emphasis of the impact of the Mosaic law. So while addressing the legislators he, he, and these liberals, he, he's, he's just basically saying, look, God is supreme over all. Don't try to reduce the emphasis of what God has said. And don't try to overemphasis over on things that he didn't mean. You're saying, what do you mean by that, Brother Jason? Well, those legislators, they wanted to not just take what God said. They felt that it was their job to add 613 things of continuance and just make it so hard that nobody can fulfill the law of God. And it is. It's impossible for anybody to do it. And they would say, well, I didn't break the law. They may beat somebody half to death, but I didn't kill nobody. They would take it to the extremities. And while others, they would always be looking for the loophole. They may have broke the law, but they would say, oh, you must offer just so much grace and so much mercy. And I'm afraid that some people just look at God as just this great big easy going, all forgiving, everyone, grandpa feel, that's just going to let everything slide. And they view the Old Testament as the Godfather that will just kill everything. And then they view the New Testament as the Father God who's just all loving and wonderful and lets it all go. And that's the problem that the 
Pharisees and the Sadducees had. They were in love with the law. They couldn't wait to talk about the law. They, they had such emphasis on, oh, the law, the law, the law. They loved the law. They loved to make the law about this and, and look at the beam in everybody else's eye. You broke the law. Well, you almost broke the law. You, let me make up. You don't fit my standard. You're one way this way and you're one way that way. And they made it all about the law. And it's not, hear me clearly, it's not about the love of the law that gets it. Yeah. That's Papa, okay? Papa. Can you say it? Will you say it? Papa. Go ahead, say it. Papa. I love her. Oh my gosh, she is adorable. Just give me a moment, would you? You know what? I lo they had an issue with the law. And they loved the law. But you know what they were missing? The love of the Lord of the law. And I'm afraid today we make many rules. We set so many things in place. We have all these guidelines that we've got to follow. And I'm going to tell you what, we can make loving the Lord hard, can't we? We're good at making loving the Lord hard. I mean, because we put all these laws and all these restrictions and all these things in the way and all these obstacles, and we forget why we do what we do in the first place. And you've got to change your mindset. You've got to look at it as just don't look at coming to church as something you have to do. Look at coming to church as something you what? You get to do. It's exciting. Don't look at doing a job or a task as that I have to do that thing. I get to do that thing. Greg, you didn't have to sing this morning. You got to sing this morning. And isn't he worthy to sing to? Amen? Amen. He's, he's worth it all. So don't, don't do it so that you don't get in trouble. And don't do it just so that he'll love you more because he'll never love you more or any less. Just do it because you love him and you want a relationship with him and you do it anyway. Well, that's where... This all came about. However, what Jesus is trying to express here is real authentic love comes from following him. Now, we are in Matthew chapter 5, and what he's going to display is this. If you have love of God, you're going to be salt and light. We talked about being salt and light. We're going to talk about um, our, our commitments, and we talked about... Uh, it's so hard for me not to say marriage and not think about the Princess Bride. Have you not seen the Princess Bride yet? Please watch it. If so, it's so funny. Marriage. It's so funny. Um, we talked about marriage, and I couldn't just talk about on that topic in one sermon setting. In fact, I couldn't just break it all down in one setting last week about marriage and divorce. And that was very difficult, and I appreciate you all coming back this Sunday after I preached on that. But you know, some of the hardest people for us to get along with is those people that we love the most. I'll guarantee you, nobody could upset you quicker than your spouse, and nobody can get you excited faster than your spouse. I mean, it's this the way that it works. How can, you, how can it be such a switch? Well, then it, then it falls in order again with how do we relate to other people? You see, if you have the love of God, you ought to treat your family the best. And then you ought to treat other people around you. And what we're going to see here is, is that we're going to see, as Jesus is going to teach here in Matthew 5, how we should relate to other people. How we should treat other people. And then we're going to keep on, um, we're, going to, we're going to look at it as, number one, keep your promises. Keep your promises. Two, he's going to talk about turning the other cheek. And then we're going to see in the next message, which is love those even when they mistreat you and speak ill of you. And you can say, I'll love you, but you must meet all my conditions. No, that's not what God said. I must love you anyway. So, so what we're going to talk about this morning is keeping your promise. And this is how we can display, if we're really followers of God, if we're people who will keep our promise. So I'm only going to touch on this one topic today. Keep your word. Keep your vows. Relate to others by keeping your word. 
And that's what I want to break this down as. So we're, we're going to be in chapter 5 now still for the uh, next few weeks. But what we see here is this, this world's approach is completely opposite to people who don't want to keep their word. As Christians, we must follow Jesus' example even when the rest of the world wants to act differently. And Jesus is not calling us to be pacifist or roll over, but he wants us to be people that not to be taken advantage of, but we are should be people that will take the high road. We should be people that will honor him and to let God deal with those people who mistreat us and misuse us. <laughs> if we're going to learn about keeping our word, we must look at what the scripture has to say about it. I've given you a moment to get to Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37. If you're there, would you say amen? amen. Again, you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, that they shall not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it's his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communications be yea and nay. For whatsoever is more than this cometh of the evil. What we must understand is, is we must be the followers of Jesus, and we are supposed to be the people of our word. Are you somebody of your word? Can I take you at your word? I mean, you would say yes, but would other people say that? Are you good for your word? I, God wants us to be as reliable with our speech as His words are reliable. God's promises are reliable, and that means God's characters are true. I, I just ask you this, is the Bible true? Yes. And is his character true? Yes. God does not waver. God does not compromise. Therefore, he calls us to be people of our word. And we should be not only people of our word, we should be people of our character. Our words and our character ought to mesh and match up. So, hear me. To be a man or a woman who, of your word, it indicates your character. Are you of good character? Uh, there should be enough strength in our character that we don't need additional words to try to prop up our statements. Uh, let me ask you this. Is your lifestyle of one that if somebody was going to fill out a resume, and on their resume are you, is your name and your words somebody of credibility that they could list as a reference? If somebody called you, are you somebody that would be a good reference? Are you somebody that's your word of just saying, I need a recommendation. Where would I go? And if you gave that recommendation, is your word good enough? I mean, you know, the weatherman, he can fib to us every day, and yet we'll still tune him in and listen to him tomorrow. Uh, I, I can tell you this. It might rain or it might not rain. Especially that's a good statement in today's time, isn't it? I, I, I mean, but if I told you it was going to rain today and it didn't, then guess what that makes me out to be? A fibber. I, I don't want to be a fibber. A fibber sounds easier than a liar, but I would just be a liar. And, and someone say, well, a little white lie. Is there a difference between a white lie and a lie? They're both lies. It's a lie. It's, it's the same thing. So we need to understand who we are in Christ. So here in Matthew 5, Jesus is speaking about people who didn't have strong character and they have to prop up their statements. So you know how they would prop up their statement? Yeah, I may have fibbed about some things, and my word may not always be true. I may tell you some eh, sleight of hand, some truth, but let me prop it up by saying, you know what, I swear by the temple. It's like saying I swear on my mother's grave. Uh, I, because my word's not good enough. It, it could be something of saying, well, I, sw I swear to God. You better be careful when you use that terminology. When you say, I swear to God, don't use that as slang. Don't use that as just cheap talk. If you swear to God, you, you, 
you don't under you better think about what it is that you're saying and what it is that you're swearing. And and, and also on other things. Jesus wants us to know that if our character is right, then the people around us accept us to just say alone, my yes is yes and my no is no. You shouldn't have to ask me to prop it up with something else uh, and, and things. Now, as a kid, we didn't have a whole lot of credibility. I used to say a statement, and perhaps you folks did too, when I was a kid, if you made a promise that you was going to do something, I would say this, I cross my heart and what? And hope to die, stick a needle in my ouch. What was I saying when I made that statement as a kid that if I break that promise, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye? Does that mean that if I broke that promise that I want to die and I'm going to stick a needle in my eye? Ouch. But that's, uh, that's how nonchalant we would have been, as, especially as children, to say, you can take me at my word, I'll do those things. But yet, I want you to note that there are those credibility aspects Enlisted in Genesis 15, you all know I'm a Genesis nut, and I don't have a problem saying that. But if you've not read Genesis 15, they talk about the one-way covenant. And a covenant is a vow. There's numerous vows all throughout the Bible. Does that mean you should never promise anything? No, of course we should promise things. <coughs> but when you say you'll do them, do them. The one-way covenant was this. They would take little animals and they would sacrifice uh, an ox. They would sacrifice a lamb. They'd put half of it over here and half of it over here. They'd put half the lamb over here and half the lamb over here. They'd take little birds and they'd put a bird here and a bird here. And they would, they would have it. And they would walk through in between these and they would have witnesses around them. And as they would walk through this, they would make a vow and just say, I agree upon whatever deal I'm making, that I will honor this vow and I will honor this commitment. And if I don't do it, then let so happen to me is what happened to these animals here. And then you would walk through and you would make the vow. If I agreed to sell you this watch for $5, then I walked through and said, I agree, I told you I'd sell it to you for $5. And then if you walked through, then you made a vow and a commitment to say, I will make a vow and I will buy that for $5. And if I don't, then let so happen to me what happened to these animals here. They put such emphasis and severity that when you made a promise, your word was good. That was your contract. Now, when we got older, we don't want to kill uh, each other, but whenever I watch old westerns and so forth, and they make land contracts, especially deals with Indians and so forth, they would come up and they'd want to make a peace treaty. The Indian would take and he'd pull out this knife and he'd slice his hand and blood and, uh, and somebody else they'd slice their hand and they'd shake hands like blood brothers I make a vow I make a commitment and they'd take that hand then I guess people got tired of cutting their hands so then whenever you wanted to make a deal it used to be good on a handshake if I'm going to make a vow and a deal with you they would spit in their hand I, I don't know where I guess it's better than cutting it right now what do we do they used to place their hand on the Bible Listen, I shouldn't have to have a Bible for you to believe my word and my character is true. But yet, whenever you go to the stand and so forth, now what we do, we don't want to cut our hand. We don't want to spit in our hand. They just say, would you raise your right hand and repeat after me? Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Now remember, all, everything you say, it's on trial, it's on stand, everybody's watching you. I mean, those were the things and the statements that we made. And yet, I think what we've done is we have diluted and our word is really doesn't have any value, no different than in the church than it does out in the world. I'm going to just share this with you. If you are a child of the king, your word matters and your word means something. Because when you break your word, the world calls you a hypocrite. That it, Your word does not line up with your actions. So how do we keep from making statements that won't end up in a lie or an untruth? How do we do that? Well, let me just share with you. Don't speak rashly. This is the first one I want to give you. Don't speak rashly. What's that mean? What does it mean not to speak rashly? Sometimes we fail to keep our word because we speak rashly. We speak too quick. We didn't really think about it. We, we didn't really think it through before we said it all the way. And we sometimes overestimate our abilities to deliver the promise. And we underestimate our words. It may be that we, uh, we personally, uh, our, our personality that tends to speak first and then 
um, listen later. I, I don't know if you all have that problem. I think I do. I talk a lot. And sometimes I may not be very quick to think about the words that I'm saying. It would be a lot better if I slowed down and think about the words that I say. And I don't want to just speak rashly. Don't speak too quickly. There's some folks in the Bible that did this. In the Old Testament, there was a guy named Jes Jespatha. And Jespatha said, um, Lord, if I win in victory, I will sacrifice to you the first thing that comes out of my home whenever I come back. And who knows what came out whenever he got back? His daughter. He spoke rashly. Listen, don't make promises that you will regret later. There was another guy in the New Testament that was often quick to say something. He was kind of like me. His clutch slipped and uh, it, the, I, I let my foot slip off the clutch and I have foot and mouth disease. Who's the first one that you think of? Peter. And, and, and so he was quick to say things, but yet didn't really understand what he meant. Matthew 14, 27, 31, And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after this I am risen. I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, listen to this, Although all shall be offended, yet I won't. And Jesus, Jesus saith unto him, Oh, Peter, 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 before the night's over and before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me thrice. Peter's like, I'll never ever do that again. Have you ever made a vow or a commitment that you didn't follow through with? How many of y'all ever said, Lord, I'll never do that again? And guess what? You did it again. I'm going to just be real, but some of you have hugged the porcelain throne. And whenever you said, Lord, I feel so bad. Oh, Lord, if I ever get out of this one, I'll never do that again. And you went back and you returned to your vomit again. It's so many times... You may say, well, I'll never speed again. You'll tell that police officer when he pulled you over, I don't know, I was just in a hurry this one time, I'll never speed again. You'll speed when you leave the parking lot today. It, it, don't, don't say that you'll do things that you won't. Don't make promises that you can't keep. Don't say that you'll take something and do it and then don't follow through with it. It's important that we keep our word. Very important. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Therefore let thy words be few. i got a good friend of mine, and you've heard him say this. He often says this, Least said, least mended. Don't say things that you can't follow through with. Um, I'm going to have to give you this illustration, and this is just a personal one. Because especially I was surrendering, I was in the ministry, I was going to school. And um, Susan and I, we had two children, we had another third child on the way. And we were looking for a house. We were looking to expand. And I'll never forget this, I was coaching basketball and I went to, uh, uh, I, as I was coaching ball, we went we found a house in a subdivision that we really liked. We really, really liked this house. It needed some different things and all, but we went. And as we went to this house, we said, we'll take it. We signed the paperwork on this home. They agreed they was going to take this paperwork. They agreed they was going to take it and all. The realtor took our paperwork. The realtor took it over to them immediately. Uh, this was like on Friday, and we had agreed we was going to buy this house. I'm coaching ball on a Saturday. As soon as I'd finished coaching ball, my phone rings, and I answer the phone, and it's the realtor, and the realtor said, um, I'm sorry you didn't get the house. And I said, I, I, do what? They said a higher bid came in. And I said, but you told me they accepted it. They accepted our offer. And they said they did, but they didn't sign it. I was heartbroken. I'll just tell you, we, we got our hopes up. We thought this was it. We thought this was everything. And I thought, but they told me. Whether they signed it or not, that's an outward expression, but they told me. But I didn't sign it. I didn't sign anything. No, your word ought to be what's said and what's good there. And it didn't happen. You didn't sign on the dotted line. That's just, I, I shouldn't have to sign if my word's good enough. 
then my word's good enough. Well, we went on, and um, during that season, I'm just telling you a little personal story. We found a house, and my friends, we found a Barbie doll house. This thing was amazing. Um, we found a house that had been on the market for two years. It belonged to an attorney. So I'm going to tell you, this was not an easy transition. When we found this house, we'd had everything, and I went, I looked at it, I looked at the man, I shook his hand and said, I'll take it, and shook his hand. I'll take it. That same weekend, it had been six months since I'd preached at Ferguson. Six months later, on the same weekend, I just told this man, I'll take that house. They called me to come be their pastor. What do I do? What do you do? I mean, a man's an attorney. I guess he could sue me. I guess, what, what do I do? I told the man I'd take it. I agreed. I would, I verbally, I was going to take this house. But God had called me to a position over here. I didn't think this through very far. I, I, I just said, yes, I would. And Susan said, what are we going to do? And I said, I'm going to have to buy this house. Well, how are we going to do that? Move to, I don't know, but I just told the man that I would do it. And we agreed, I'm going to take this house. I shook his hand. And guess what? I bought the house. Now, this house had been on the market for two years. We got to live in our Barbie doll house. And we stayed there, had everything packed up, didn't even unpack it all. And I'm going to tell you how God moves and how God will honor your word. When it came time for us to make the move, I put the sign out for sale by owner. We had not, not just two years it was on the market, two buyers that were ready. And that house sold in two weeks. Amen? God will honor. Don't, don't make rash statements and honor your word. I, as a preacher, as a young man, how would it appear if I, as a preacher, but how would it appear as if you, if you back out of your word on everything that you say you do? How would it be if you don't show up when you say you'd show up? How would it be if I came in here today? I mean, a lot of expectations are on me, but also I think it falls back on you. If I say, hey, I'll be here every Sunday, I'll be here, I'll preach, I'll honor, I'll be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Well, you're supposed to. You're the preacher. There's no difference between me and you. We're all children of God. When we make a vow and we make a commitment, the same accountability should be before us all that we will honor and do the words of what we call. So here's what we got to do. we got to weigh our words carefully. And we should be careful to avoid exaggeration and superlatives. Don't use words like, well, I will always. No, because you don't always do. Don't use words like, well, I will never do that. Because sometimes we do do that. And don't use words like, well, absolutely beyond the shadow. No, don't, don't go there either. Proverbs 13.3 says, He who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. I know you've heard some popular quotes said before, but it's better to keep your mouth shut and appear ignorant than to open it and remove all doubt. Another one that I like is this. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. You say, where'd that come from? Proverbs 17, 27, 28 says, He that... Uh, Knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed as a man of understanding. You know, what was the words of E.F. Hutton? When E.F. Hutton speaks, what? Listen. You know, we need, to, um, we need to be thinking about the words that we say and that they have value. There's a third and final thing I want to share with you, and that's avoid unrealistic promises. Avoid unrealistic promises. It's dangerous to make promises when they are dependent upon circumstances that are beyond our control. Ephesians says this, Ephesians 5.5 5 says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Don't make promises. Don't just say, yes, I will absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I will be there at 3 o'clock. We don't know what might happen. They might be working on the bridge down here, and you might get stuck in traffic. But you, what would be a better way to say it? I will do my best to be there on time. Wouldn't that be a better way to say it? 
for me, I just need to say this. I'll try to be there today. <laughs> that might work for me a little bit better. I will get there when I get there. That might be a better way to say it. Um, when's the best time to call you? I'll, I'll call you as soon as I can. But don't say things that you can't follow through with. James 4, verses 13 through 16 says this. Go to to now that ye say, Today or tomorrow I will go into such and such a city and continue there a year. And buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what, to, uh, what will be of tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth but for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings for such, a, for, uh, such rejoicing evil. What is it that they used to say, I'll be there if what, the, the creeks don't rise? And what's, how's it, how's it go? If, it, if it's a good Lord's will and the creeks don't rise. You know, that might be a good statement for us to say. I'll do, uh, why don't we say it more so, I will hope to be there. I will try to be there. I'll, I'm going to do all, I'll do my best effort to be there. But if you say that, follow through with that. So why do I say all these things? Folks. Your words matter, and words have eternal consequences. Words are something that we should make sure that we evaluate and we adjust because words have eternal principles, and your words can make a difference where you will spend eternity. And you know what Jesus says to all of us? Follow me. And let our yes be yes, and our no be no. There's a parable that the Bible speaks of where the man is addressing two of his children. He asks his children and says, I'd like for you to do this. The one son says, yes, Dad, I'll do it, and he don't do it. And the other son says, no, I won't, which sounds disrespectful, but then he turns and he changes his mind. Folks, I think making a vow and making a commitment is very, very serious. And I think we as a church need to understand that we are accountable first to God, then to each other, and, and our representation to the Lord. God's simply saying this. Don't look for the loopholes. Don't look for the way out. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Don't skate around it. Don't look for the loopholes. But just say, I'll do this. For the Bible says, Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make thy hair white or black. Some of us can. Now today, we can change our hair color. But you can't change. When you make a mistake, you've made a mistake, don't, don't, don't set up for failure. You do what God's called you to do and follow through with it. Well, folks, that would conclude it, and I'm going to end this sermon a little bit differently. I'm going to ask you, first of all, to make a vow today. And that vow should be thought through. It should be thought through clearly, and that vow should be don't put off salvation. Don't put it off till tomorrow because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Don't put it off till tonight. If you're going to say, Lord, I'm going to follow you, but not right now. Lord, I might do this, but not today. Listen, when you make a vow to God, you follow through with that. And I believe your words should matter. And you should be willing to get behind this and say, Lord, I'm going to weigh my words. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And I want to encourage you, weigh your vows and weigh your words. He's standing before you and says, follow me. Church, will you follow him? Will you follow him? Now, I want you to think that through. And here's something that we're doing here at Oklahoma. I know our time has come, but I want to share this last and closing thought because I didn't have time last week. And next week is our homecoming. And I encourage you all, bring some food, bring some friends, and bring some good time of fellowship and fun. But this might be as a revolutionary idea. And my hope is, is that we've talked about this now for years. We've talked about it in deacons' meetings. And I want you to think about some things. First of all, we want to invite you to be a part of the family of God. I can't stress that enough. God says follow Him, not follow me, not follow anybody else in this church. You follow God with everything that is within you. Follow Him, follow His will, follow His ways. And we want you to be a part not only here of the family of God, but I'm going to ask you to be a member of His church. And if I'm wrong for this, then I apologize to you if you take offense, but I believe membership matters. I believe being part of a family matters. 
I believe that you should hold an accountability to family and you hold accountability to friends and, and I challenge you to step up because I want you to be a part of the family of God. Please hear my heart more than anything. I don't want anybody to be out of the will of God and if you're going to follow God, we are to hold each other accountable and say, I will do that thing that I said I would do. And I will be the best Christian I can be. I will try my best. I will strive. But I need help. I need efforts. I need, I, I, I need, I need this. I encourage you, salvation, second membership. I want you to be a part of this family if that's where God's leading you. But also if God's leading you to be a part of another church family. I want you to be where God wants you to be and serve where God wants you to serve. I think where little is expected, little will be given. Did you hear that? Where little is expected, little will be given. And I hold this as a great honor and a great responsibility to be able to serve God. And I challenge you here today, would you be willing to participate? If you're part of this family, we want you to be a part of the family as an entirety. You belong here. You're valuable here. And I'm, I'll just be blunt, and I know if we're recording, that's fine. But I, I, as a pastor, it breaks my heart to strive so hard to see folks come and I want to see them become part of the family of God and join and, and accept God and then go adrift and backslide and go their own way. It breaks my heart to see people come and come to this altar and say, Brother Jason, I, I'm so excited about this church. I want to be here. And then I, where are they at in a few weeks? Where are they at in a few months or a few years? And I see them leave. Did I do something wrong? Did you do something wrong? What did we do? Did we break our vow or our commitment? Did we not make room for them at the table? I want this to be a church where, where people feel welcome and, and, and they can come because as a pastor, it, it's hard to see folks come and go and you, and you worry about so many and we, we wonder where you're at. And we, you have a place here and we want you to serve here. And we're a family and we hold each other accountable in love. So... My job as a shepherd is to make sure that the sheep that we're, we're working towards that common goal of working towards the Lord. Every year we come to start our new church year in September. September the 1st, and it ends on August 31st. And I'll just be honest, I just feel like we're always starting something new. I just feel like about the time we get everybody in positions, it's time to try to reignite and try to do it again. But you know what? Life happens to all of us over the course of a year. Maybe your lifestyle, maybe you've had a health obstacle that you had that's gone. Maybe you've got a new job and you couldn't, do, you couldn't sign up for commitment last year, but you can this year. Or maybe you've taken on some things and you can't be as committed as you once were. You still have a place here and we need you here. But as a pastor, it is my responsibility to encourage you, encourage you. If you're going to sign up to do something, let me encourage you, church. I'm not, I promise you, I'm not trying to be mean. You're not just making a commitment to me. You're not just making a commitment to those folks around you. You're making a commitment to God. And you say, I don't know if I can do that. If you're that wavering, don't, don't take it. I, I, I don't encourage you to take it, but be in prayer. Pray about this. So we are encouraging, and we've talked about this, and we've got it drawn out. They're out front. I have extra here. I want you to think about this. Paul says, this one thing I do, this one thing I do, do it with excellence. God's equipped us. He's called us. God is laying something on your heart. Say, I will do this. I will do it to the best of my ability. I will be invested into it before. I'll pray about it. I'll do it, and I will follow through with it even after it's done. But what this is, is we want to give you a seat at the table. I'd like to see people come to the family of God, and we want you to know that if God's called you here, there's a place for you to sit at the table. On this front one, it is a list of standing officers. What is a standing officer? It's myself and the deacons. We don't vote on that every year. But this is where we're all at, and we're at this table here. You can see all these things out in the vestibule when you go out. There are bylawed positions that we have to vote on every year, and that's a, because even though we're a church, but we do operate as a business, we, we have organized an organization. And our bylaws say we, in, we have a clerk, an assistant clerk, and a treasurer, because we keep things in order. I mean, that's the way it should be, accountability. Directors. If you're willing to be a director... That means that you're saying, I'm going to take on as a, a senior adult ministry, which Stan has done, and a brotherhood, and uh, assistant youth, and WMU, and a grow director, our worship team. Sign up, you know. Um, let me just be clear on this. 
we have an organist and a pianist, but we also have your sister, and we know your, they, you, you and your family take care of, of your mom. But you know what? His sister is able to come once a month. Let me ask you something. Does she have a place in this church to serve? Yes. yes. Because of the restrictions of life. So we need to make sure she can be an assistant and a help, and that she wants to play and to do these things. I'm going to tell you what. has value here. Booklink. I'm so thankful for, for uh, BJ who helps with Booklink and doing these things. It's, it's, it's maybe one thing, but it's, it's within time restraint. He, he can do that, and it's a work, and it's valuable, and it, we never know the full impact of where our books and our Sunday school books get to go on to. It's a wonderful ministry, and I'm thankful for that. When, when we think about audio and visual, it is expanding immensely up there, and I'm thankful. So what's the difference between directors and coordinators? Coordinators are this. A coordinator may be just saying, look, my lifestyle's changed. I can't do everything, but I still, I can commit to this. And I know uh, there's some of us, we can, do, we can do all these jobs. But that's not the way that it's designed. We can do everything, but it, it gives room for someone to say, I can't be here all the time. My life's commitment is this, but I would like to do this, and I will make a commitment, and I will follow through with that. How about Sunday school? You know what? We've got some amazing teachers and, and, and the collectors and those that will help count the offerings. And, and if everybody gets involved, it doesn't make, it's not hard on all. Team leaders. What's a team leader? What's the difference between a, a director? A director helps oversee, but a coordinator is one program. But a, a, a team leader is this. It gets together teams. And if you're willing to be a part of a team, be a part of a grow team. Um. I'm asking everybody to take no more than two things. Sunday school doesn't count. Everybody in this church ought to be in Sunday school, and I make no apologies for that. It's a great place to come and be involved. Come to Sunday school and also be a part of a grow team. Those two things don't count. I need to make sure I stress that. Everybody ought to be on a grow team, and everybody ought to be in Sunday school. Sign up for a grow team one Thursday night a month. Children's, children's church. Sunday school teachers, Awana, our ministries. I could go through all these, and for time's sake, security team. Folks, maybe, you know, it's, it's nice to be in here, but we have a wonderful security team. And the more people we have, the more availability it gets them to be able to come on the inside and serve as well. Van ministry, VBS, kitchen. I'm asking you to pray. I'm asking you to pray. I'm asking you to seek God's face. I'm asking you to say, Lord, how can I serve you to the best of my ability and how can I give you my best yes? My best yes. Not a half-hearted, how can I give you my best yes? Everybody has a place in this church and you need to be able to fulfill that. I encourage you, pray about it. There's a little sticker out there. You write your, down, your name on the sticker and you have a seat at the table and you put it on that number out there. I could explain it more and I can talk to you more about it. But if you want to know more about it, please get with me. But let me just first by say this. Musicians, if you would, would you come? Hear my heart, not the laws and all this other stuff. Are we so rigid? No, I just want to make sure that you know that you are loved here at Oklahoma. Our motto has been love God and love others. And I believe that we are a loving church, and love ought to be the main forefront of everything that we do. And don't serve Him out of legalism, and don't serve Him out of legislation and all that. Just serve Him because you love Him. And everything that you do, you do is unto the Lord. In the church, out of the church, you are His representative. And I'd like to invite you to stand with me all over the church house and... You're saying, Brother Jason, your expectations of me are too hard. I'm not asking you to do anything else other than what this book would have you to do. And that's be committed to Him. Commitment. I believe God's committed to us. I know God's committed to us. He will not fail you. He will not fool you. He will not lie to you. We may stumble and we may come up short, but I'm going to just encourage you to do this. Would you give Him your best yes? Would you say, Lord, I'm going to serve you with everything that I have? And I'm going to invite you to come. As musicians are going to play, do we have a hymn of invitation? Yes, in your blue book, page 187.